Now I'm going to use our tragedy of the commons artistic creation to explore externalities. I've never approached this. I don't think I've ever approached this quite this way, but I think as the as I've gone through our narrative here, I think it lends itself pretty well to doing that, just the way this has come out to th this time. Just a quick review of what we're saying. We had a common resource, the area around the village here, where everyone could use it. And um, as it got used more and more, uh, it created a situation where things were worse for everyone because of the fact that everyone could use it and that it's degradable in some way. So, and I'm going to explore that, what I just said there, in greater detail as we go forward. So, we came up with some solutions. We could charge taxes to reduce this problem, to reduce the incentive for everyone to use it. If we're applying a tax for the particular purpose of reducing use of something because the use of it is bad, there's a name for that kind of tax. It's not the kind of tax, this name is not what you find in the tax code or something like that. It's what you find in economic theory. A tax that is designed to curb the use of something is called a Pigovian tax. P-I-G-O-V-I-A-N, Pigovian tax. Uh, that's, that's spelling from memory. Uh, yes, P-I-G-O-V-I-A-N, Pagovian tax. It's designed to tax something. It's designed to deter the use of something. Uh, so that's why it's there. It's not to, ra to raise revenue like our income taxes or our sales taxes per se. That's just a uh, upside to it as far as the government goes is that it does raise revenue. So we explored that. Uh, we looked at the tradable permits where... We could have a permit for the use of the common resource um, that's issued by some form of government, some collective uh, agency. And uh, those permits then would allow people to go ahead and degrade the environment, this common resource, to, to the extent of the, the allowance of a permit, and they're tradable. And uh, that discourages people from using them because... Since they're tradable, if they don't use it, they could sell it, which gives us, it gives the non-use of the permit economic value, which makes it economically valuable to not damage the common environment, the common resource. Now, on that, saying that that time around in this review, I'm so, so, sorry to say that reminded me of something I don't think I said in the earlier video about our, our wonderful piece here. Um, that option, it tends to be that the people who are really like sort of like pro environment, they don't always like that option because it does allow pollution or the degradation to happen. And I am I'm transitioning, aren't I? I'm transitioning away from our common resources around here into the common resources of nature. When I'm now I'm talking about pollution, it's the same kind of a thing, though, isn't it? We're wearing out this thing, whereas pollution is wearing out the environment around us. Right, people who are opposed to, uh, particularly opposed to uh, pollution, sometimes they don't. They find the t tradable permits, and even taxes, but particularly tradable permits, tough to stomach because it's accepting damage to the common resource or to the environment. It's saying, "Hey, this much is allowed. Let's permit this much," and sometimes that's 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 a hard thing to to uh, get people to accept uh, if they're adamantly opposed to the degradation of the common resource or pollution. So, but that's just, that is one solution. That's one alternative we have. Another alternative that we looked at would be to, to cease to make it common, but to make it private. That's what these purple lines were, was to make it private property. Okay, in our original, initial drawing, of course, the purple lines weren't there. These purple lines would make it private, and the allocation of the property, who gets what parcel doesn't matter in terms of efficiency, in terms of doing away with the tragedy of the commons. It does matter in terms of equity or fairness, because we could have a situation where the rich party ends up with the larger parcel, either by 
political connections if the property is just distributed by the quote-unquote government, or it could happen if the property is auctioned off by the quote-unquote government. Um, personally, I would lean toward auctioning the parcels or the tradable permits using that scheme because at least then it raises revenue for this common good and that revenue could be used. You wouldn't use it to seed the grass if you've done the private property. Why would you do that? It's theirs. No, but you could raise revenue by selling parcels of land and use it to build a school or whatever. So those were our alternatives to address the, the tragedy of the commons. And the heart of the tragedy of the commons, what, what's really the, tra the cause of the tragedy is that adding a sheep, as is incentivized to do, harms everyone else a little bit. Harms oneself, but it hurts everybody. The costs of adding a sheep get shared. So I'm going to go ahead and erase, now that I've ran back through what we've done there, I'm going to erase these purple private property lines get us back to the common resource that was there. And as I do that, I'm going to keep talking about this concept of adding a sheep. As each farmer is incentivized to do, they add a sheep. And every time they add a sheep, it puts the land at greater risk. And the land is shared by everyone. In other words, the actions that I take have costs that are borne by others. So I go out and I buy a sheep from someone who sells sheep. That's a two-party transaction. The fact that I did that as the consumer of the sheep, and it may be that I'm a firm in this example, but that's okay. The fact that I did that now is going to be, there are going to be some other costs that are going to get passed to everyone else. And that's called a negative externality. And that's tends to go along with our common resources. I know I mentioned this before, but now I'm going to put a different twist on it. Had to review that to put this different twist on it. it. Since we have these brown lines due to all the sheep out here overgrazing the common resource, someone might say, well, I'm just going to go seed the grass. I'm going to go spread some grass seed and fertilizer and improve the grass. So let's say this household down here, and I don't think I picked on this one. Let's, let's say this one. This one says, I'm just going to go out back and spread some grass seed. Grass seed isn't all that expensive. It, uh, it takes me some time, but I'm going to go ahead and make my grass behind my house greener. Okay, so here's the greener grass back there. I'll take out some of the orange lines. Now, they bought and they bought grass seed. That's a two-party transaction, them and the seller of the grass seed, okay? And because they did that, how does that treat everyone else? Everyone else is actually made better off if they were to do that. Right? Because now there's greener grass out there. So that's called a positive externality. It's not the greatest example because, as we'll see in a second, no one would do that. That's, that's the problem with the tragedy of the commons. But if they were to do that, they would be passing along, by, by making this two-party transaction, they'd be passing along some benefit to third parties, the other households. Now, that's, a, that's, a, that's the definition of a positive externality. The reason that we wouldn't expect that to happen here, there's a name for the reason. It's called the free rider problem. The free rider problem. Not freeloader. Nice guess. Free rider problem. It's a problem because if this person does this with the grass seed, all the sheep are going to make their way over there and eat up the good grass, right? So what benefit does the person derive by doing that? They don't really derive the benefit, they just, they just carried the cost. These folks all got a benefit from it without carrying a cost. Since this household was bearing a cost and getting only some small benefit, and everyone else was getting just as big a benefit without bearing the cost, it actually is net putting this person behind. And since these folks can get onto that, their sheep can get onto that grass and overgraze this grass, there's no reason for that situation to happen where one household would say, hey, let me go make the grass better. And the, the, the absence of that reason, the, the reason that there is no reason, is called the free rider problem. Anyone can get a free ride on the expense being borne by one household. 
And since anyone could do that, they all sit and wait for somebody to step up and buy grass seed. I'm not going to buy grass seed. It doesn't pay to buy grass seed. All I have to do is wait for you to buy grass seed. And since everybody's in that situation, nobody buys grass seed. So it doesn't actually happen. And that's called the free rider problem. It doesn't usually get associated with the tragedy of the commons, but I think with this, I just didn't want to over, I didn't want to underutilize this wonderful artwork that I had, so I'm applying it to the tragedy of the commons. Um, the most frequently cited example of the free rider problem, it, it goes like this. In the early days of lighthouses, and I've drawn this out and made a big deal of it, but I don't think I have to do that. In the early days of lighthouses, I believe it was in England, lighthouses were a private endeavor done by people who wanted to be firms. They were businesses. And just so you know, the purpose of a lighthouse is it's called an aid to navigation. I was a Navy quartermaster. My collateral duty was rescue swimmer. But a Navy quartermaster is a person who rescued, or, uh, navigates the ship. Okay, So I know a thing or two about aids to navigation. It's been a long time, but I do know a thing or two about them. Aids to navigation are like buoys, lighthouses, there are uh, sound devices out on the water, there are channel markers that line up like this and stuff like that. Stuff that keeps ships and boats from running aground because water has shallow places and rocks and shoals and stuff like this. Uh, and in, in limited visibility, even shore is a hazard. Um, so they have these, these devices, these road markers out all around the world in waterways. <clears throat> lighthouses are one of them. The idea of a lighthouse is it has a signal to it, like the light might blink two or three times and it flashes, a series of flashes, and that's marked on the chart. And navigators on ships, even in the dark, can see those flashes and say, oh, that's that's Absecan light. So the Absecan Inlet is just south of that or north of that. I there is an Absecan Inlet, and I don't know what, what, anything about that light, but it's something like that. So they can see it in the dark. They also have those sound devices on it so they could hear it in the fog so they can get their way to the inlet and not run into shore. And that, in the old days, a lot of goods were lost at sea and lives, but a lot of property was lost at sea because of shipwrecks. And aids to navigation have reduced that, okay? So <clears throat> a lighthouse has a large economic impact. It allows the ships to come into a port without running aground. And so somebody, a private citizen, I think in England, said, hey, if I could get a little slice of that big pie of all the shipping going in and out of, let's say, London, man, I could be very rich, right? And I can provide a service. I can keep these ships from running aground, keep the sailors from drowning, get the property in and out of the harbor, just get me a little something, something, a little slice of that, and I'll be very rich for doing a good thing. So that was the idea. So they put up lighthouses. And the trouble was, no one had any incentive to pay. Because how do you keep someone from using light? Anyone can see light, right? So you say, well, surely some of the ship owners would pay to have access to the light. And surely some ship owners would. The situation is such, though, that knowing that, if you're a ship owner, why should you pay? All you have to do is let somebody else pay, and then when they, when the light's there, you can just go on in. And so they might come up with some scheme where they say, okay, well, we're just going to hire, hire someone to sit out there in a little boat, and when one of the ships comes in that has paid, they'll have a sticker up on the bow. And they do, we do do this on, on the waters now to identify who's paid for what permit to do what on the water. I have them on my boat. Um, they got a sticker. Well, well, now we would radio. Maybe we'll semaphore back to the lighthouse. Turn on the light. Here comes someone who's paid. So that means the people without a sticker are just going to sit out there until a ship comes that has a sticker, and then they're going to follow it on in because light is, it's not free. It's not free, but it's not excludable. Anybody can see it. And since that's the situation, anybody can be this free rider. No one has an incentive to pay. So it's not a very good private business. Because it's not a very good private business, it's been provided by the public sector, i.e. government in the United States. The U.S. Corps of Engineers and the United States Coast Guard build and maintain our aids to navigation in the United States because there's no 
incentive for private institutions to do it, or there's limited incentive for private institutions to do it. And a big part of why is what's called the free rider problem. And this video is going on fairly long. I think I've utilized my artwork as much as I can. I thought about getting a whole new whiteboard and just keeping this, you know, up on my wall, but I think I'll let it go. And I'm going to erase this and I'm going to explain in more detail some of the concepts that we've used this to introduce.